Joining us are Carla Robbins, Deputy Editorial Page Editor of the New York Times, and Garrick Utley, President of the Levin Institute of the State University of New York and former NBC News correspondent and anchor. Garrick, wonderful to see you again. You're welcome. Carla, always nice to see you. Let's start with the President's speech. Historic in every way. Um, what did you think? It, it was an incredibly adult speech, and I must admit I felt a great deal of relief. I mean, after the last eight years in which it's always with us or against us and bullying and hectoring, it was a reasonable speech. I mean, it wasn't soaring oratory, but it was a speech of reason, and I really recognized that United States. I felt good about the country, and I think that people will understand us better in the Arab and Muslim world because of it. I had no doubt that you would like the speech. Garrick, though, I know <laughs> it's very good. predictable? <laughs> I think it was very good to use the term an adult speech. If you read the text, if you really go through it, it was one of the most craft, well-crafted speeches in terms of every nuance, every button that was touched. In terms of where it's going to take us, which is the real subject now, uh, my feeling was that Obama went to Cairo. He, you know, he, he came, he spoke and now fill in the dots where it's going to be. We won't know for several years. And I think what we're really looking at there, as he covered the whole situation from the middle uh, Israeli-Palestinian to, to Afghanistan, Pakistan, he didn't dwell on, but that's there on the table, is where he's going to put his efforts now. Where do we go from here? And um, I think the immediate issues of Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan are going to be the key ones. And Israel, Palestine are already there and will always will be there. But that's, that's what he has to decide how to use his time and energy. You know what's really intriguing is that, is that, is that oh, the president promised during two years ago that he was going to give the speech in the Muslim world. They were very conscious of perceptions and wanting to set a new tone. And I would talk to people in the administration and they would say, just from the moment they got into the White House, where do you think we should give the speech? What do you think that we should say? That was a big debate. Where should we help? And what do you think we should say? They took this very seriously. And I got the impression that people kept asking that question because he was asking them that question. They really cared about about setting the agenda, having this, this new thing. Now the challenge, of course, is what are they going to follow through, through on, as Garrick said. But I think mm -hmm. the very fact that he said all of those things in that context is incredibly important. Because Cairo said, is the intellectual, traditionally the historic intellectual center of the Middle East. There was a lot of thought that went into every bit of this, not just the words, the placement, everything. Yeah. Um, there's been a huge amount of analysis of this. Uh, to the point, of the, as I think even an article in the Times said, it's like you're looking at a religious text and people have been lifting out. Parsing and parsing and parsing. Yeah, yeah. parsing. Can we overanalyze it? Can we, can we think too much about it? I think, uh, yes, we can. And we know that people hear what they want to hear in a speech. But particularly in the Middle East, they also hear what, or listen for what they don't want to hear. And that's what you had in this speech, particularly in the Israeli-Palestinian equation. Everybody was listening not just to what he was saying that they liked, but particularly what they don't like, which shows that there's, you sort of depart from, I don't want to say from a negative position on both sides, but it's been so deeply rooted. What did he actually say that's going to advance the Israeli-Palestinian Well, if dynamic? you're Israeli... How do you listen to that speech? What do you think of what's said? Well, obviously, people are very sensitive to this because they're very dependent on the United States. Every prime minister in Israel needs to have a good relationship. And this is a prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, who is trying to roll the tape back, to move back from the commitments, including of previous conservative governments itself. And the president was quite clear is that, you know, settlement activity has to stop. You know, the humiliation, you know, the occupation of, of, Palestine, of the Palestinians is, you know, with the, that, that there's a humiliation to this. So he was quite strong. But when you think about it, and the Israelis are crying foul today, he didn't ask. Netanyahu to commit to more than the Israeli government had already committed to. Who are we to dictate to Israel when it comes to the issue of settlements? Well, not Sorry. dictating, but we are certainly Israel's strongest ally, and he is reminding the Israelis of the commitment that the Israeli government has already made to a two-state solution and to an end to settlement activity. They committed to it already. The, what do you call it, a road map, the history, it's there. Everybody knows what the situation is. It comes down to a, a will to act, and it really hasn't been strong enough. With Obama now, he used the phrase, a new start, a new beginning. Sounds great. What I was thinking, reading and listening to the speech was, to what extent can he, with his own human personal story and biography, impose that in a substantive way? once the speech is done on the dynamics of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I don't think anybody can say with confidence, no matter how remarkable his life story and biography is, that that's going to be the determining factor. No. It takes more. It does. It does. And, of course, actions are what everyone will measure the success of the words by. I want to turn to Tiananmen Square, the anniversary. This was actually overshadowed as a result of the president's big speech. Um, we are 20 years from the massacre that took place there in China. 
Um, what's the legacy from China? What do we take away from how China is today and how China was then? I think what we take away from the fact is that 20 years later, they flooded Tiananmen Square with so many police that nobody could protest. The fact that they closed down internet sites, that they, the repression is still there. And there has never been an accounting of, of everything that happened. So for all of the progress that China has made in the last 20 years, economically, for the no question that the lives of Chinese have improved. There's still corruption. There's still a huge amount of repression. Everything that the students were protesting and complaining about, very little of it has changed. This is where America normally would step in, trumpet democracy, and say, this is wrong, this is wrong. Secretary of State Clinton did issue a, a sharp statement, but are we compromised in what we can say? I think we're limited in what we can say. Yes, she made the statement, which was strong. The Chinese came back with a strong reaction, saying they have proven that they're on the right path. There predictably. Was the, predictably. Yes. There was a large demonstration in Hong Kong, where there is still a large amount of freedom, which was very important symbolically. But in many ways, this is a test between the power of memory and the power of for, forgetting, uh, or it's a contest between the two. Now, are people going to forget it? Not absolutely. But it was also interesting that this was the week the Secretary of the Treasury, Tim Geithner, was in China talking on very sensitive issues because of the amount of our financial future they hold in their accounts, our bonds and debts. And he um, was speaking in a quite different tone. And so business has to go on in many ways as usual. And so we are not compromised, but we are limited in what we do and say. But Hillary didn't pull her punches, and that's the good news. I would have thought with Geithner there that they may not, might not even have said anything as strong as they did. So I was actually sort of relieved by that. And, and what does this say for the future of the relationships between our two countries? We're going to keep walking this delicate balance? Do we have a choice? I don't they're, think we do. They're a big power. We're a big power. They're very sensitive about their history. We're very sensitive about our history. Yes, we're going to be walking that. They also own a huge amount of our papers. So yes, it's going to be a very tense relationship going forward. I think this administration is trying very hard to manage it, and they have toned down a lot of the sort of protectionist rhetoric that you saw from the Democrats when they were out of power. Tiananmen Square happened uh, just a few months before the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of communism. The conventional wisdom for the Bush administration at the time and others, secret to future prosperity are free markets and free people people, democracies. The Chinese have proven since uh, Tiananmen Square that they can have a well-functioning economy without having personal political freedom. There is a new form of capitalism with the market system and the political system that has been developed there. That's a model. Is it going to work out forever? Who knows? But I think that's one of the takeaways when you face the reality, and that was the reality that Tim Geithner and the Treasury and the American administration was facing this week. We have to leave it there. Carla Robbins, always good to see you. Garrick, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much.